time of praise and worship. We give God all the glory. Lift up your voice once again and begin to thank God for the privilege afforded you to be in his house tonight to give him praise, glory, honor, and adoration. Thank him. Give him praise. The Bible says that blessed is the man whom God chooses and causes to approach unto him. Thank God and give him praise. Magnify his name and give him glory. Lord, we thank you. We give you praise. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being called your children. Thank you that we can boldly come to the throne and obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Spirit of God, we thank you tonight. We give you praise. Lago shagadada bacanto brende vesibala so de brehendese. In Jesus' precious name. Lift up your hands with me as we thank God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for tonight. We bless you. We give you praise. We magnify your name. Thank you for the gift of life. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to appear before you. We have come with a hunger. We have come with a longing. Meet us at the point of our need. Let your word come with understanding and revelation. Grant me utterance. Cause me to speak your word with precision and accuracy. Let no man or woman listening to me right now under the sound of my voice watching this broadcast now or whatever time ever remain the same. Be glorified in the life of all. In Jesus' much less name. Amen. Great to have you join us tonight. If you're watching online, I want to encourage you to start a watch party and then uh, share the link with as many po people as possible. If you're also new to our YouTube channel, I want to encourage you. Just go ahead and subscribe and click the bell button so that you always be prompted when we are on. It's good to have you join us tonight. I have no doubt that by the time we are through, your life would have been changed dramatically by the word of God. In Jesus' precious name. Well, let's go straight into God's word. Let's go straight into God's word. This is what the Bible says. For the past almost two months, I've been teaching on understanding the times and the seasons. And I hope to finish it up tonight. And then we would zoom in and join our mainstream Sunday teaching series. Uh, another session of it in our midweek service. So, uh, that is also an interesting time growing in grace. I'm sure that it's, it's, it's blessing those of you who have been consistent with the Sunday services already. So we will also be shifting it onto this platform. So our midweek services as well, so you can comprehensively be blessed. Now let's get back into 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write unto you. Concerning the times and the seasons, the broad teaching has been understanding the seasons and the times. In Acts chapter 1 verse 7, And he said unto them, For it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own authority. Then again in 1 Chronicles 20, 12 verse 32, And of the children of Issachar, which, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. Their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. The Bible says the men of Issachar were in command because they had understanding of the times. I pray that as the Spirit of God brings you understanding of the times and the seasons, showing you the right step to take, I see you be in command. I see you command take command over principalities and powers. I see you take command over everything that is taking command over your life. I see you subdue every satanic agenda that is manipulating your life. In the name of Jesus, you can go ahead and type in the comment box, amen, if you are watching online. Praise God. Now, so we are looking at understanding the times. We've looked at it in diverse ways, but the focus on the last bit of it is on the end times or the last days. We need to understand the end times. We need to understand the last days because it's very important. People are always wondering whether we are in the last days. Prophetically, we are in the last days. We are actually in the last of the last days. The last days began in the days of the apostles. When uh, Peter spoke, he said this was what uh, prophet Joel spoke about that in the last days, so it began there in the upper room when the Holy Ghost came, and we are still in the very last of the last days. He says, but know this, that in the last days, eschatos, in the last days, perilous times will come. In the last days. 
Now let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. So we'll be seeking to bring clarity to the events of the last days. Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we'll be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them, even if they claim to have, to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man who brings destruction. So that is Apostle Paul there. So it's important that we are not deceived. And for us not to be deceived, we have to, be, we have to stick with Scripture. Because the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the word of God says in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by thy word, for thy word is truth. So until we know what Scripture has to say concerning the event of the last days, we are likely to be deceived. By people's revelation, by people's dreams, by people who say, I died and uh, I was taken to hell and all of those things. Some of them may be true, others may be false. But when we stick with scripture, we can be sure we will always be on the right path. So concerning scripture, our study has focused on the first and second letter of Apostle Paul to the church of Thessalonica. And we have read different accounts and we've established that there were four things that the church needed to do and we are also expected to do as we wait or await the coming of our Lord concerning the events of the last days. The return of our Lord puts four responsibilities on us. Number one, we said it puts a responsibility to wait on us. And because I'm finishing it today, hopefully, I need to recap a bit. Come with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we have to you, and how you turn to go from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven. To wait from his son, for his son from heaven. To wait. So this church was waiting for the coming of the Lord. Number two, we said that the second responsibility is a responsibility to work. The responsibility that the coming of the Lord puts on us is a responsibility to work. The fact that we are waiting for the coming of the Lord does not mean that we should be idle. We should abandon work. We should abandon productivity. We should abandon purpose. No. There is an assignment he gave us that we need to be executing. The assignment of reaching a lost world with the gospel. And there is also purposes. Individual, personal purposes God will have us to fulfill. And to fulfill those purposes, we need to work. Just like he placed Adam in the garden to uh, work. Of course, we also need to work because it's a means by which God meets our needs. It's stated in scripture. In the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 10 to 12, he said, For even when we were with you, we commanded you with this. If any will not work, neither should he eat. So according to scripture, if you don't work, you must not eat. Even if you are hungry. If you don't work, you must not eat, particularly if you are of a working age, 18 years plus, and you are still depending on people, begging for one Ghana, begging for 10 cities, is an anti-scripture, is anti-covenant. You should be ashamed of yourself to be sending text messages instead of finding something to do. Can you send me 50 Ghana? Can you send me 30 Ghana? This is a time for repentance. This is a time to accept responsibility. Find something to do and be productive with your life. The Bible says, whatsoever the hand find it to do, do it with all thy might. That's important. Number three, we are called to watch. We are called to watch. And the Thessalonian church was a watching church. We are told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write unto you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord comes so it comes as a thief in the night. Jesus will come like the way a thief comes. And if a thief is coming to you, you need to be watchful. If you'll be able to escape a thief from doing damage to you, you need to be watchful and receive the grace to be watchful. The Bible says, watch therefore, for you know not neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. We don't know the exact date that Jesus will come. He may come tomorrow, he may come next year, he may come the next 1,000 years, we don't know. But in every generation we live, every day we live, 
we have a responsibility to be watching. You must be watching as if he's coming in the next minute. You must be watching as if he's coming in the next second. Be watchful. That's critical. And then, of course, the final bit we want to look at today is witnessing, the call to witness. So there's a call to wait, there's a call to work, there's a call to watch, and then there's a call to witness. Let's look at how the Bible puts it. Now, you remember that in the book of Matthew chapter 24, verse 3 to 4, Matthew 24, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him, tell us, tell us when these things will be and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of age. Then Jesus began to outline a series of actions, a series of signs that will herald the coming of the Lord and the end of age. And amongst many things, when you go to verse 14, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. And then the end will come. This gospel of the kingdom, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness unto all nations. Then the end will come. That's a call to witness. Who is going to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth? We. We who are saved, we who have been mandated, we who have been entrusted with the gospel. You remember what Apostle Paul said? He said, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory in. For necessity is laid upon me. What is me if I don't preach the gospel? For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if I do this against my will, a dispensation is committed to my trust. The dispensation of preaching the gospel to a lost world the dispensation of restoring the world to God, that dispensation, that responsibility is on our shoulders. And we need to rise up to the task of word evangelism. We need to rise up to the task of reaching out to our neighbors and everyone, people, groups, everywhere with the gospel of Christ Jesus. And that is a tall responsibility. That is a responsibility that the Holy Ghost was essentially given to equip us for. In the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 7 to 8, while Jesus was about departing, the disciples came to tell us again when these things will be. And when the, he said, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons when the Father has put in his own uh, authority. But verse 8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come. And you shall be my witnesses. Take note, we are called to be witnesses. We are called to be witnesses. Now, coming back to look at the church of Thessalonica. When you look at the church, you realize that the church was not just a waiting church. It wasn't just a watching church. It wasn't just a working church. It was a witnessing church. And I pray that Faith House will become a witnessing church. I pray that you, as an individual, you become a witnessing Christian. I pray that wherever you find yourself, you'll be a witnessing person. That's what the church was about. The church of Thessalonica was a witnessing church. Aggressively reaching out to people. And let's look at the account. Paul wrote to them, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 to 10. We always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. As we pray to our God and our Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are reading from the New Living Translation. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. From when we brought to you the good news, take note, when we brought to you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true, and you know of our concern for you from the way we lived with you, when we were with you. Look at verse 6. So you received the message, take note, you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought to you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. Seven. As a result, you have become an example to all believers in Greece throughout Macedonia and Achaia. Eight. And now, the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere. Take note. The word of the Lord was ringing out from them to people everywhere. The Bible is yours. Go ahead and underline everywhere. Even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it. Amazing. This was a wonderful church. Nine. 
For they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. Verse 10. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He's the one who rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. Now let's do the message version, verse 7 to uh, 9. Verse 7 to 9, message. Same text, verse 7 to 9. Do you know that all over the provinces of both Macedonia and Achaia, believers look up to you? The word has gotten around. Your lives are echoing the master's word. Not only in province. Take note, your lives are echoing the master's words. Not only in the province, provinces, but all over the place. The news of your faith in God is out. May the news of your faith in Christ be out. In your workplace, may the news of your faith in God be out. He said the news of your faith in God is out. We don't even have to say anything anymore. You are the message. May faith house become the message. May you who is watching me at this time become the message. In the name of Jesus. He said people come up and tell us how you receive us with open arms and how you deserted, take note, you deserted the dead idols of your own life so you could embrace and serve the true God. Amazing. Amazing. The New King James Version, verse 8. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. From you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith toward God has gone out. So that we need not to say anything. May your faith go out everywhere. We must make our faith known. If you look at the church of Thessalonica, their faith was known everywhere. Everywhere they go. Everywhere a Thessalonian, a Thessalonian Christian went, people knew that this was a Christian. And I pray this same prayer over this commission. And over everyone watching me at this time, if you have truly professed faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior, may your faith in God go ahead of you everywhere you go. When you work in a clubhouse, may they know you are born again. When you work in a Guinness firm, may they know you are born again. Anywhere you find yourself, may people testify that truly you are a child of God. May your faith go out. May your husband who lives with you under the same roof know that you are born again. May your husband, your wife, testify that truly you are a child of God. May everybody who is your classmate, who knows you, see that truly you are a saved person in the name of Jesus. Now these guys made sure that their faith was everywhere. People knew them. They were witnessing. They were testifying of the, of the saving grace of Christ. How did they do this? They did this in two ways. They made their faith known in two ways. One, through their lives. They made their faith known through their lives. When you read the message version of verse 7, he said, do you know that all over the provinces of both Macedonia and Achaia, believers look up to you? The word has gotten around. Your lives are echoing the master's word. Your life must echo it. My life as a preacher must echo that I'm saved. It should not just be a word I say with my mouth. It should be something that is reflective in my life. My life must echo it. Don't forget the Bible says we are a piece being read. We have the letter being read. So people must be able to read us and see that no. The way I'm reading this man, this man looks like he's born again. The Bible said when they took, they observed Peter and they saw the way he spoke. They said of a truth. This one has been with Christ. I pray that in your office, when people see the way you do your work, they will say of a truth, you have been with Christ. They will say of a truth, you are born again. When your classmates meet and they are chatting and they meet you, they will say of a truth, you are saved. If your roommate comes in contact with you, may he say of a truth, you are born again. Your life must echo it, not only in the province, but over all the place. The news of your faith in God is out. We don't even have to say anything anymore. You are the message. May you become the message. Our deeds must be loud. Our deeds, our good deeds must be loud. So that we, there is little we say. When your life is really reflecting Christ, you don't have to say much before you can get a neighbor in your neighborhood to follow you to worship your God. When your life is consistent, 
with the gospel and you are not compromising. You don't have to say much for your boss to know that you are in truly a child of God. In the house of Potiphar, they could see that Joseph was different. The Lord was with him. He will not do what they were doing. I pray the grace of God to reflect, live out your faith. That grace, may that grace locate someone in the name of Jesus. These, the Thessalonian Christians received the message and they modeled the message. They received the message. I wrote here, I said, this important quote you should not forget. We cannot function as effective witnesses if we fail to live out the values and virtues of the gospel we receive. The values and the virtues of the gospel we have received, they must be seen in our lives. The values of holiness, the values of kindness, the values of compassion, the values of love, the values of good works, those values must be lived out of our lives. We can't be professing faith in Christ and be practicing uh, vice on the other side. No, that is inappropriate. I said, until our character reflect our convictions, our behavior matches our beliefs, and our fruit become consistent with our faith, we will fail in our calling as witnesses of Christ. May you not fail in our, your calling. The Bible said this is a faithful saying that those who are believing in Christ Jesus must be careful to maintain good works. So our lives, the second way was through their lips. Our lips. We have a responsibility no matter how much, how well we live, no matter how holy we live, it's important that we understand that we are called to preach the gospel. We are not just called to be witnesses. We are also called to speak out as witnesses. We have to speak. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8. New King James says, For from you, for from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. The word sounded forth. It has sounded forth. The original Greek word out of which we have the word sounded forth which is translated sounded for, is the word, the original word is the word, the root word out of which we get the Eng English word echo. Echo. The word echo comes from the root word of that Greek word, ezikataya. That means sounded forth. That means our lives must, our lips, we just echo what God has said. We must know what God has said and speak it. We must know what God has said and speak it. We must speak it for. We have a responsibility to speak for the word. Look at what the Bible says. We have a work to do as evangelists. Every born again child of God is an evangelist. You may not function in the office of an evangelist, but you are called to do the work of an evangelist. I'm not saying that you are called into the office of an evangelist, but I'm saying you have been called to do the work of an evangelist. Look at what the Bible says, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 to 5. He said, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Preach the word. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. He says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own last shall they heap to themselves, teachers having eating ears. Verse 4, he says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and be turned, shall be turned unto fables. Verse 5, he says, Verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. When we preach the word, we are doing the work of an evangelist. And I pray that from henceforth, you will preach the word. May your life preach the word. May your mouth also be open to preach the word. You should not be ashamed to speak to people about Christ. No, never feel ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is power. Plant the seed anytime you have an opportunity. Plant the seed anytime you have an opportunity with your boss. Don't be pushy in the office. Be gentle with him, but plant the seed. Plant the seed with godly character. Plant the seed with excellence in your work. Plant the seed. Any opportunity you have, don't let a soul, don't ever come in contact with the soul and assume salvation for the person. It's deadly. Salvation is so important that it should not be assumed for anybody. You sit in a plane and you happen to sit by somebody. I know we are in COVID season, but with your face mask on, engage the person. Are you born again? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you die today, do you know where you are going? It's important. 
Because you never know when death will seize that person that you are meeting for the first time. And if he's not born again, he's doomed to perish in hell. And we have a responsibility to reach out to multitudes with the gospel. So we need to preach the message. The message we have received, the message we have modeled, we also must go and preach it. Now, what kind of message are we supposed to preach? Because most sometimes people preach and they don't know what they are preaching. And it's important we get to know what we are preaching. The Bible said, the Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news. Good news. The gospel simply means good news. Good news to the sinner is that your sins have been paid for. Good news to the poor is that your debt has been canceled. Good news to the homeless is that an apartment has been designed for you, you can move in. That is good news. And I want you to know good news to the sinner is that God loves the sinner. We have preached hell and hell and hell and hell as if the message we were given was a message of hell. Hell is a real place. But let me tell you, we have not been called to preach hell. We have been called to preach heaven. And when we are able to paint enough, we are, we are able to paint a good picture of heaven to people. They, they themselves will make the choice. Everybody, every human being who loves his life and is normal likes nice things. If you can give people a better picture of heaven and what God wants their life to be, even on earth, before they get to heaven, hell will not be a place they will desire. So understand the message we have. We have not been committed with any message. We have been committed with a specific message. What must characterize the message that we sound for? Three things. Number one, our message must be a message of redemption. Our message must be a message of redemption. The Bible says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's why Jesus came. He came to redeem us. Came to redeem us. Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 to 14. He said, giving thanks unto the Father who had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He says, who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. He said, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sin. We have redemption. Go ahead and tell people. Don't tell the sinner around you that he is doomed for hell. Tell the sinner around him, my brother, there is redemption for you. There is redemption for you. Because of the sacrifice on Calvary's tree, there is redemption for you. You don't have to live with sin. You don't have to be controlled by sin. You don't have to be controlled by immorality. There is redemption for you. There is redemption from the shackles of the enemy. There is redemption from the bondage of our call. There is redemption. Redemption. Preach redemption. Preach redemption because that's it. The church of Thessalonica, they were bound to idols. But when the redemptive message was presented to them, look at it, 1 Thessalonians 1 9. When they received the redemptive message, the Bible said, People come and tell us how you received us with open arms and how you deserted the dead idols of your old life so you could embrace and serve the true God. That's what happened. When they received the message of redemption, when they got to know that who the son sets free is free indeed, and they chose to embrace the son, the Bible said that was the end of it. They turned from idols. Oh, we'll come back to that. So our message must be a message of redemption. The Bible said, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Titus 2, 11. It has appeared unto all men. So every man, those who are saved, those who are not saved, the grace that brings salvation is available unto all. Provided they will reach out, redemption is here. May you receive redemption. Hear me. No sin is irredeemable by the blood of Christ. There is no sin that is irredeemable. Say, Pastor, I've, been, I've killed somebody before. I've aborted children before. I've aborted a baby before. I have womanized before. I have cursed before. I've done all kinds of things before. Hear me. None of those things you have done is enough to resist the saving power of the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ has enough power to redeem you from any kind of sin. If you look at that life of Apostle Paul, that was the kind of life he was in. He says, I thank God. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord 
who had enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the work of the ministry. Look, Apostle Paul began to list all the things about himself. He said, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So the first message we must preach is a message of redemption. The message of redemption. Number two, it must be a message of reconciliation. Message of redemption, message of reconciliation. The first R is redemption. The second R is reconciliation. Look at what the Bible says, 2 second, second Corinthians 5, 18 to 19. And all of this is a gift from God who has brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. God has given us, he has reconciled us and has given us the task of reconciling people to him. Look at this. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Take note of that. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Look at how the Bible puts it. I like the message rendition. He has given us the wonderful message. How come people are not ready to receive the message from you? How come when you speak to people, they get rebellious at the gospel? May I submit to you, it's most likely you are presenting to them a false gospel. You are not giving them the message of reconciliation. You are only pointing to them their fault. You are only telling them how awful they look. You are only telling them how bad they are. You are only telling them how worse they are. You are only telling them how, how, how God hates them. You are only telling them about the wrath of God that is awaiting them. That is wrong message. The right message we have been given to give to our world is a message of reconciliation. What is the message of reconciliation? That God is not counting people's sins against them. <laughs> God is not angry with man. His anger has been pacified on the cross of Calvary 3,000 years ago. Jesus laid down his life and that pacified God's anger against humanity. So now all men have access to God provided they will enter through that access by faith. The gospel is good news. Stop misrepresenting Christ. Stop giving the wrong message about God to people. Sometimes, the way we preach and the way we talk about God, it makes sinners even resent to want to know our God. But our God is a good God. He's a loving Father. It's good news. Jesus never preached the message of condemnation. Never once. If you look at the ministry of Jesus, never once. Did he have the opportunity to do? Many times. When they brought the woman caught in the act of adultery, they expected him to condemn him. When he spoke to them, they all left. You remember what he said, neither do I condemn you. Why? Because he knew why he came. Jesus knew the exact reason why he came. In the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, John 3, 16 is the most powerful and the most quoted script verse in the whole of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, he said, For God did not send his son to, into the world to condemn the world. So, you hear people preaching and telling people they are doomed for hell. Listen, hell was really not made for men. Hell was never made for man. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. And because the devil is wicked, he's trying to get people on his side. The same way he got some angels on his side and they rebel in heaven, he's still trying to get people. That's why some people may end up in hell. But it is not the will of God for anybody to go to hell. According to First Peter, God does not want anybody in hell. He wants all men saved. And you and I have a responsibility to tell people about it. Let them know that God doesn't need them in hell. God wants them in heaven. God wants them to have a good life on earth and to enjoy eternity with him. That's what God wants for man. And that is what we must communicate to people. That is what we must preach. And that message is a message of reconciliation. You remember the prodigal son? He messed up big time. But when he came, his father's arms were open. His father's arms were open. And all of us used to be like that. In our Sunday morning series, we have looked at the natural man and we said that the natural man is all of us. All of us used to be natural men. You are saved now, but you used to be a natural man. And for all of us, that is how we are. Those who are not saved now, they are natural men. And we need to reach out to them aggressively 
telling them about the good news of reconciliation, that God wants them back. God wants to reunite with them. God wants to share fellowship with them again. That is good news. Don't you think so? It's good news. It's good news. If you had offended someone and you were running away from the person and the person sent a message to your phone via WhatsApp or tested you and told you that, listen, all your debts have been cancelled. I just want to have a meeting with you. How happy will you be? That is the kind of message God has given us to give to our world. And from today, I pray that you go all out to preach this good news. When we say we are preaching the gospel, that's the gospel. Of course, in closing, we also need to preach the message of repentance. So our message must be that of redemption. It should let people know that they can be free because God has already made them free. And then it should let people know God is not cross with them. God is not angry with them. God is at peace with them. God wants them in fellowship with him. God is at harmony with them. God is at peace with them. That's it, what we are supposed to do. And of course, we should let people know they need to repent. Because that is the doorway. There is redemption. There is reconciliation. What you need to access it is repentance. 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 Look at what uh, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost came, Acts 2. And now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. Say so repent. What shall we do? He said repent. So now you have heard, maybe you are not born again. If what this, you are watching this broadcast, you are not born again. You are asking me, what shall you do? There's reconciliation for you. There's redemption for you. What you need to do to access it is repent. I'm reminded of the prodigal son's story. He left home, messed up, and felt his father would not accept him. So he was actually coming back to the... He said, when I go back, I want to become a servant. He didn't know the plan the father had for him. And most of us, we think God is angry with us. God is not angry with us. We, are, we may have messed up our lives, but God is still ready to accept us anyway, anyhow. That was the prodigal son. But they had to do something in order to be restored. There was reconciliation for him. There was redemption for him, but he needed to do something. And that thing he did. He said, I will rise up and I will go back to my father. And I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Today, you have watched this broadcast and you are in the same place the prodigal son is now. Maybe people have, religious people have misrepresented the gospel to you. You felt that God was angry with you. You felt that God hated you. You felt that you are beyond redemption. Today, through God's word, you have come to see that there is redemption already available. There is reconciliation for you. The only thing you are expected to do is to repent. What sin should you repent? Just is it the sin I did yesterday? You have to, everybody is born a sinner. Everybody born, maybe you say, I've never done any sin. It's true. But once you are born by man, you are, you are born a sinner. So you need to repent. So this minute, before we get into the communion, I want to give you the opportunity to acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because that way, you can be raptured, you can, be, you, you can become a part and parcel of God's kingdom. Then you are well placed to wait. You are well placed to work. You are well placed to watch. And then you can also begin to witness like we are doing to you. I want to pray with you if you are ready to make a decision for the Lord. Repent from your sin. And embrace his redemption and re embrace his reconciliation. Bow down your heads if that is your decision now. Bow down your heads. Say this after me, Lord Jesus. I thank you for the privilege of hearing your word. Thank you that your spirit has made me aware of who I am. I'm a sinner in need of your grace. I admit you this moment that you are my Lord and my Savior. I confess with my mouth, believing in my heart that you died for me. Thank you for saving me and making me your own. I receive grace to live for you and to reach others for you. In Jesus' much less name. If you pray that prayer in faith, I'm glad to let you know you are saved. I'm happy to hear that you have, made, you have made that decision. We want to reach out to you and help you in your work with God. We want to guide you, teach you, and help you to be able to advance in your work with God. Send us a WhatsApp, send us a mail, 
Give us a testimony and so we can reach out to you and follow up on you. The Lord bless you as you do so. The numbers are on the screen. You can make use of any of them and reach out to us.